Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this panel session. My name is Lisa Springate, and I head the legal and technical team at Jersey Finance, and I chair the local Institute of Directors. We have an hour set aside today during which we will be covering the proposed changes to extend the civil financial penalties regime, the reasons for those changes and what they mean for you and your business, and how the JFSC is seeking to streamline its decision-making process. I'm delighted that we'll be joined shortly uh, by Minister uh, Senator Ian Gorst for External Relations and Financial Services. But beforehand, I would like to warmly welcome Kerry Petula, Director of Enforcement at the JFSC, and George Pearmain, Director of the Government's Financial Crime Strategy. We were also due to be joined today by Jill Britton, Director of Supervision at the JFSC, but unfortunately, members of her family have tested positive for COVID and she therefore sends her apologies. We wish them all the very best in this regard. And I'd also like to congratulate Jill on behalf of the industry for the recent announcement that she will be interim director general with effect from September following Martin Maloney's departure. And we're very grateful indeed for all of the hard work that Martin has contributed during his tenure at the JFSC. To let you know how you can get involved whilst you're on air, please go to any tablet and enter slido.com and when prompted to do so, type in gov, G-O-V, and then J-F-S-C, and then type in your question. And we really welcome seeing those questions coming through. Already on Slido, I've noted that there's quite a few, uh, which, is, which is good. Um, but in terms of uh, providing an overview of these forthcoming developments, um, we'd like to uh, go to a recording that has been made by Senator Gorst um, which details the financial strategy, the financial services strategy, the financial crime strategy, and Jersey's response to the various taxation changes. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining this session. I hope the next hour will be an insight into changes to the civil penalties regime. If you have questions, please submit them using Slido. This event is being recorded so you can watch it again and it can be seen by those who are unable to join us today. Engagement is vitally important if we are to successfully adapt for the future. International policy initiatives in corporate taxation, supranational regulation from the EU and further transparency initiatives driven by the G7 and G20 are all challenges we can face together. Government is working with industry to ensure that we maintain our position as a leading and well-regulated international finance centre. The Jersey Financial Services Industry Policy Framework is currently under review to ensure that we have the legislation and support needed to remain competitive as a jurisdiction. I will be telling you more about that in due course. The civil penalties regime being discussed today is part of our support for the global fight against financial crime, money laundering and the financing of terrorism. The Government of Jersey has made several commitments to combating financial crime and illicit finance and to protecting the international financial system from misuse. These efforts are based on the standards developed by the Financial Action Task Force, the Global Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Watchdog. The FATF developed international standards that aim to prevent these illegal activities and the harm they cause to societies across the globe. Those standards are set out in 40 recommendations, which ensure a coordinated global response to preventing organised crime, corruption and terrorism. Jersey is one of more than 200 jurisdictions to have committed to implementing those recommendations. We made that commitment almost a decade ago and our international reputation is based, in part, upon maintaining that commitment. Shortly, Moneyval will evaluate Jersey to determine whether we are adhering to the FATF standards. The Moneyval process is not a simple or a short one. The process takes two years to complete and will start next year. We expect there to be an on-site visit towards the end of 2023 
with Manival's report being adopted and published by the middle of 2024. By working together, we have ensured that past evaluations by the IMF and Moneyval have been success stories for Jersey, bolstering Jersey's international reputation. Of course, we want to deliver the same outcome this time. And demonstrating that Jersey remains committed to the FATF standards will require significant efforts by us all. Jersey's high quality international regulatory environment is a critical selling point for Jersey. Ensuring that we pass Moneyval's evaluation will require changes in policy, legislation and procedures. Government has allocated significant resources to this and you can expect increased industry engagement in understanding risk and finding solutions to common issues. Jersey's success as an international finance centre is based on striking the right balance between commercial innovation and regulatory flexibility that meets international requirements. If we want to continue on this successful path, we need to make sure that our commercial activities are embedded in a regulatory regime which is compliant with the FATF standards. Our objective is to be seen internationally as attractive to the right kind of business, but unattractive and hostile for criminal activity. The consultations we are discussing today propose the introduction of civil financial penalties which are already in place elsewhere. The ability for a regulator to impose proportionate and dissuasive sanctions is important. Jersey's agencies should have the power to take appropriate action when individuals and firms contravene the rules. And those powers should be applied in a way that is as efficient as possible. We've seen similar fining powers used to significant effect by our competitor jurisdictions. We have the opportunity to learn from others assessing where they have done well and where they have not done so well. It is for this reason we are considering this area in advance of our own Moneyval report. Our proposals will enable the regulator to apply a wider range of penalties to a wider variety of businesses. But those businesses are already subject to anti-money laundering and terrorist financing provisions and have been for some time. In other words, the penalties we're discussing today are tougher, but they are for obligations on businesses which already exist. These consultations do not change those obligations, but the regime will change the way in which contraventions of those obligations can be dealt with. This is just one of several aspects of the financial crime policy which will be reviewed over the coming months. We want to clearly explain what we are planning and why. There are many areas we should see as opportunities to demonstrate our best qualities to Moneyval, and we want to work together to achieve that. We will endeavour to increase our engagement with industry as we update our financial crime policy and strategy work leading up to Moneyval. And please let us know how we can best engage with you. Thank you very much for attending today and thank you for getting involved as we move forward together in Jersey's best interests. Sincere thanks to Senator Gorst, Minister for External Relations and Financial Services for that very helpful overview. Now, George, if I can come to you uh, as Director of the Financial Crime Strategy uh, within Government, We've seen that these uh, two consultations have been issued recently, one by government and one by the JFSC. The deadlines for each are both the 1st of September and the consultations can be found on the government and the JFSC websites. But what would be really helpful for our viewers online, George, if you could um, provide an overview um, in relation to the government consultation, please. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and, and thank you to everyone for joining this afternoon. It's a pleasure to join you all here virtually uh, to discuss these important consultations that form the backbone of potential changes to a critical part of Jersey's financial crime infrastructure. As was noted by the Minister in his opening remarks, this area is particularly important for us to focus on to ensure we've paid appropriate attention to what is deemed to be a critical area of any financial crime regime uh, in advance of our money value evaluation. This is particularly uh, so we can look to be in the best position possible 
uh, to demonstrate that we are complying with international standards and that we have an effective penalty regime in place in Jersey, which is considered proportionate and dissuasive uh, in nature when considering our risk and contacts at an international finance center. The relevant FATF standard here that we're talking about is recommendation 35 on sanctions. Uh, and this calls for a wide range of penalties to be available, uh, which are deemed to be proportionate and dissuasive. Uh, and these penalties have to be both criminal and civil in nature. Now, in line with other jurisdictions such as the UK, Guernsey and the Isle of Man, uh, the consultations are putting forward proposals of keeping parallel civil and criminal liability. Uh, we are not moving to a regime where we might see a more EU style with different approach to civil fining powers. However, the proposals do significantly change the way in which the application of civil penalties work in Jersey, including their kind of breadth and depth. Uh, and we are fully committed, therefore, to a full process of consultation uh, and taking on board comments through this event today uh, and also in writing after the event. When considering penalties, the FATF says we must start at the point uh, of considering that the regime in whole in place uh, must remain persuasive to financial crime uh, and proportionate to the issues identified. At the moment, with the current regime in place in Jersey, we cannot say that is the case when we compare with other jurisdictions around the world uh, who have now fully implemented the FATF standards. Our current regime is quite a significant way behind what has already been implemented elsewhere. It's also particularly important when talking about this consultation to note that a number of international finance centers worldwide have had significant issues found in their AML CFT regime, particularly relating to penalties. Many of you will have noted the findings in relation to the Cayman Islands and Malta. Uh, and recently, we are starting to see a significant uptick in penalties issued across the different range uh, in other IFCs, notably seeing penalties issued in Cayman in different ways to where they've been issued before, uh, and also closer to home uh, in Guernsey. Failure in this area for an evaluation uh, would be really significant for Jersey uh, and would risk grey listing uh, and issues of negative impact on the economy. However, uh, we shouldn't be taken up with considerations there when we think that civil penalties actually in a wider regime uh, can present some upsides and improvements on the current regime for industry as well as the authorities. Civil penalties uh, regimes uh, that exist elsewhere and what we're putting forward uh, allow for greater flexibility uh, and the ability for processes to be conducted more swiftly. Uh, they allow for the ability for firms to resolve regulatory issues uh, without recourse to court uh, and potentially criminal identification uh, and criminal convictions. There are different ways, however, that jurisdictions have enacted compliant regimes with inside the FATF standards, uh, and that very much is the reason for the consultation papers uh, and why we welcome the responses together. Two particular areas of note of flexibility is the mechanisms in which jurisdictions use for implementing penalties uh, and the potential levels of penalties that can be applied to create that persuasive regime. Now, whilst this work is looking at civil penalties work we're doing, uh, it's important to note today that we're also considering potential amendments to the overall regime uh, in terms of dissuasiveness. And that also involves examining existing criminal law provisions and proposed changes may be forthcoming in that area on due course. The consultation was deliberately aligned with the DMP revision being carried out by the JFSC, uh, as this is a critical mechanism and a part of the process uh, that the JFSC used to ensure penalties are issued in a fair and proportionate manner and to allow for, allow for a timely conclusion of matters. This aligns with positions taken by regulators now across the world where penalty processes have been in place for some significant time, uh, including for AML failings uh, and in respect of individuals. Uh, we have the consultation open until the 1st of September, which is designed to give ample time for all of industry to respond, and we would welcome this. And that's the same as the DMP consultation. The government's intention here in advance of our 2023-24 money vow review uh, is to bring forward legislation in the last quarter of this year before the end of the current state's assembly. There's not a significant amount of time to bring this forward, uh, but we are committed to a full consultation process in place uh, and bringing the legislation forward well in, well in advance uh, of the money vow evaluation. Thanks, Lisa. Many thanks, George, in, in relation to the background to the government's consultation. It's very helpful indeed. One thing I'm hearing from members, though, is um, does the JFSC really need greater powers? Um, doesn't it have enough already, George? Thanks, Lisa. So the key thing here is to look back to FATF Recommendation 35 and see what's there that we don't currently have. Uh, and there are really four areas where there's significant changes that we need in order to be in line with the international standards. 
So the current regime in place for penalties only applies for codes, which is effectively conduct related issues. It does not have the specific related provisions for AML CFT provisions found under the money laundering order. Second area for change is that we need to extend the regime to cover all DNFPPs. Now I'll take the opportunity to explain that, that terminology. It's very FATF terminology. It stands for designated non-financial businesses and professions, uh, which usually means uh, lawyers, accountants, and estate agents, but there are other categories of individuals in there, uh, such as, for example, casinos, uh, lenders, high value dealers. The third area where there needs to be change uh, is that the application of penalties needs to apply to senior management. Uh, and individuals can look at definition in the consultation paper, which no doubt we'll come on to discuss later. And we do welcome comments on that. And the final need for change uh, is really around range of powers. It's to ensure that the powers are dissuasive and proportionate uh, for all firms. So that will mean that in all circumstances, a penalty could be issued uh, that would be dissuasive and proportionate. So those are the powers that the JFSC needs uh, in order to bring us in line with the international standards in these areas. Thank you, George. Now, if if these powers do go ahead, uh, and I appreciate they're under consultation and review at the moment, when will they come into force and uh, will they have retrospective effect, George? OK, so on, re on date into force, uh, that will depend entirely on adoption by the state's assembly. But currently, once adopted, as these are amendments to primary law, uh, we can expect uh, approximately three months or so. Uh, and on our timeline, we'd expect them to be enforced by at least the middle of 2022. On retrospective effect, uh, the regime won't apply retrospectively uh, unless there was activity that occurred prior to the law coming into force and had continued after the law coming into force. This could apply, for example, in a situation where controls required under the money laundering order, uh, for example, policies and procedures that are called for, uh, are in place but are found deficient after the law came into force, but they were also in place prior to the law coming into force. Uh, as the extension of the regime focuses particularly on control measures in the money laundering or order, uh, that would be a realistic possibility of how that could apply. Thanks, George. Now, one um, question that certainly is, is very popular actually on Slido at the moment, and uh, which I'm hearing quite a lot from um, IOD and the JFL membership over the course of the last few days since these consultations have been issued, George, is why should compliance staff and senior management, and we obviously need to be clear as to what the definition is of senior management, but why should they be liable for the failings of the boards who are, after all, George, responsible for the overarching governance of a supervised person? So I think here it's critical to look back at international policy setting. This is not about making senior management responsible for failures of boards. Uh, if the firm is found deficient, then that will be the responsibility of the board, which will likely be reflected in a penalty on the firm. However, the international standard here, particularly in relation to poor behavior by senior management and individuals in firms around the world, uh, has moved on and has decided that penalties should really be dealt with on a two pronged basis, firstly on the firm uh, and secondly on the individuals in senior management. And that has been in reaction to, to scandals around the world of individuals in senior management. So the inclusion of fining uh, of natural persons in financial regimes worldwide has been in many ways understandable uh, to ensure that senior individuals who act with consent or connivance, uh, they act intentionally or recklessly uh, or with neglect uh, are held to account and international policymakers have, have clearly signaled this is a requirement. Uh, this is and has been the direction of travel for some time uh, and is a part of financial regulation that Jersey will need to adopt uh, in order to be deemed compliant with the international standards. Now, George, I can see coming through on Slido, there's quite a lot of questions about the impact on businesses and the dynamics within businesses as a result of, of that. And perhaps we can come to that shortly when we look at the Slido questions. But before we do that, I'd just like to um, welcome Kerry, who is a uh, Director of Enforcement at the JFSC, um, and um, just discuss the consultation which has been issued at the same time by the JFSC, the deadline for which is the 1st of September, and in terms of how that dovetails with the government one. So the JFSC, Kerry, is consulting at the same time about making changes to the decision-making process. What's wrong <laughs> with the existing system and how is the JFSC proposing to improve it? Thank you, Lisa. So um, like every organisation and business, we would expect uh, a review of processes to ensure they're efficient and still fit for purpose. Um, so we undertook a review of our decision-making process um, and we concluded that it was um, in parts lengthy um, and cumbersome. We also uh, noted, therefore, that the process itself to take uh, a contested case through um, the decision-making process to reach 
and enforcement outcome was unduly lengthy. Um, the review committee uh, played a key role in that lengthy process. Um, it's excessive um, and indeed a very slow process. Um, but equally, the composition of our board of commissioners to hear those cases means that enforcement cases traditionally have to sit within the regular cycles of, uh, of our board of commissioners. So the proposals that we've come to to streamline and make that process more efficient is to replace our review committee process with a more informal internal process, um, but equally to move towards three board of commissioners to hear cases that we can then convene on an ad hoc basis. And I think I would stress here that this is for contested cases. Uh, this doesn't include a settlement process. Um, which is something that we will later issue uh, further uh, guidance on. Um, but equally, the decision-making process is still committed to a fair process that's compliant uh, with human rights. Okay, thank you. Now, since 2015, when the legislation was introduced, we've seen, I think, pro probably about three or so penalties issued. If the scope is, is set to change with more individuals and registered persons becoming liable and responsible, um, are we going to see a dramatic increase in enforcement cases and regulatory sanctions? I mean, the question I'm about to ask, and I'm, I'm sure that you and your colleagues have heard it many, many times, are we simply ticking a box for money, Val? So I think the extension of the regime taking uh, the stretch further from financial services businesses to the non-financial services uh, sectors will likely see an increase um, in enforcement outcomes um, as, we, as that the regime is broadened somewhat. Um, and that's the same in other jurisdictions, as George um, has already said. I think, to be clear, there are no quotas here. Um, mm -hmm. There is no tick boxing um, in terms of the amount of enforcement cases that we take through. Uh, we will pursue cases where they are serious in nature, um, resulting in significant and material breaches of the, uh, the regulatory requirements in the AML-CFT uh, regime here in Jersey. So I think that would give uh, the reassurance that the cases we take are going to stay within the most significant um, and material cases. Okay, but I think that very much leads on to the question. Um, we've already got uh, a difficulty within the island in terms of sourcing experienced uh, compliance staff, and we certainly, you know, within Jersey Finance and the IOD, hear of um, sort of, you know, members saying about the soaring costs for them as a business by having to have these expertise um, uh, available. But Obviously, if these powers do get extended, then surely that's just going to raise the bar even higher um, and it make it more difficult for businesses. I mean, is that really the best for, for Jersey going forward as a jurisdiction? So I think in terms of uh, what's best for, for Jersey in the financial sector, we have to take the clear steer from FATF in terms of creating a sufficiently dissuasive environment um, in Jersey. Um, there, the current scope um, of our sanctions regime at the moment encompasses uh, senior management and directors, and this is an extension of that regime. Um, we certainly didn't see the challenges in the space when we introduced the civil penalties regime for principal persons. Um, so um, I think we will see people up in their game in terms of training and qualifications um, in this sector, um, but indeed um, I think there are there are key people um, with, with good quality um, staff um, in the compliance sector in Jersey. Okay, I mean, this is quite a popular theme I can see as well on Slido, which uh, I'm going to come to now um, for you and George, if that's okay. Um, thank you to our audience for all of the questions which are coming through and for liking those which are uh, the most relevant and, and of concern to you. Uh, just a reminder for anyone who has just joined us online, um, if you go to slido.com um, and when prompted to do so, enter gov, gov, and then JFSC. Um, I believe that the details are on the screen now. Um, and then if you just pop in your question, if there's already a question online which you'd like to push to the top of the queue, then please do like um, that question and that, will, uh, and that will do so. So just in terms of uh, some of these uh, questions which are, are coming through, um, I think the first one, will we see a decline in persons wanting to take on a key person role um, and the impact it will have on the business to recruit for those key person roles? So I think that sort of very much dovetails that question, but it's certainly top of the Slido poll. So do you think it is going to be more difficult, uh, Kerry, to, to recruit uh, for, for businesses? 
I think it, it will be interesting for us to see how this goes forward. Um, we didn't see, or other jurisdictions haven't seen this challenge, um, so we don't envisage that at this particular time. Um, so I, I think um, making sure that uh, the relevant training and qualifications are there for people. But like I say, we, we didn't see that when we introduced the principal persons regime. So I don't think we envisage it um, here. And um, as George has already alluded to, um, this framework exists um, in other uh, jurisdictions, and we haven't experienced um, that there. So. Okay, I mean, unfortunately, there's some views to the contrary here. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's one that's from um, uh, MLRO that's saying, I know a number of respected and inexperienced individuals have already left industry due to the ever-increasing regulatory burden, and this, this, won't, this won't help. Um, in terms of just going back before, when we were sort of saying about um, those members sort of, you know, sort of away from the board, board members. So there's one question, FATF use senior management examples as being directors, deputy directors, board members, those approving PEPs or new business, so senior managing directors, trustees. Why are um, compliance officers, MLCO and MLRO included? Is it, is it, as we were saying before, in terms of very much to ensure that everybody is joined up in terms of the same approach uh, to... Uh, combating uh, financial crime. Absolutely, it is, it is seeing that um, combined approach. And equally, we have seen instances where the decision making around AML and CFT measures are taken outside of those roles. Um, so it's important that we ensure that the, the people who are making decisions in that area um, are captured by, by the regime. Okay. Now, George, if I can come to you, um, this is again something that I've, I've heard from members as well over the last few days uh, with these consultations. Are these, consul are these consultations or are they just a done deal, George? So thanks, Lisa. No, they're, they're not a done deal at all. Um, the consultations have flexibility in them, as I've mentioned. One is around the, the range of penalties that can be issued in the in the framework. Uh, the other is around the mechanism. But a point that actually has just been landed on in, in the question you asked previously uh, is exactly that area. So a point was asked about the FATF examples, they are non-exhaustive examples in guidance and they're not written into the FATF methodology. Uh, in other jurisdictions, you do see examples where decision making is being made by MLROs and MLCOs uh, and they are being issued with penalties. So, so this is not something that is black and white. There's a fair amount of gray and this is where we're really interested in, in comments. But I want to be clear, the FATF examples are non-exhaustive and guidance rather than part of the methodology, which is the Bible of, of the standard. So note, we're very keen on understanding uh, views that come, for, come forward and, and hence why we've left so long open for the consultation. And, and just to recap, those consultations both uh, close on the 1st of September um, in, in relation to anybody that wishes to submit responses to the government consultation um, and or the JFSC one. Okay. Now, in terms of perhaps, I think, Kerry, this is one for you. In terms of what work have you done to consider the impact on key persons and resourcing? So I think this is something that we're really interested to hear from this consultation that is out uh, now. Um, having looked at Slido, we can see um, the, the comments coming in there. So I think we would really want to hear from people through mm -hmm. the consultation process so that we can consider that and, and carefully uh, consider the response. Okay. And just sort of leading on from that in terms of um, there's, there's sort of questions in terms of how will the finance industry cope if there's a mass resignation of experienced key persons who by nature are risk adverse and will not want this additional risk? I mean, is there, again, is there a good consultation going on with, with industry um, throughout this process? So I think this is where this consultation um, is really important. Um, and um, I think we need to give careful consideration to the feedback that we receive from the consultation. Um, and I guess, George, I don't know if there's anything further that you would like to add in terms of this particular consultation around civil financial penalties. Yeah, but thanks, Kerry. So I think the issue here around experienced compliance staff is not unique to Jersey. This is something that in evaluations of jurisdictions around the world we're seeing. Uh, and indeed, the government are working closely with the JFSC and the industry to try and build a, a better people strategy for the future to ensure we have those skills built into people in the workforce in the island. Um, that said, it, it, part of this is around regular consultation with the industry about the challenges they're facing. Uh, I, I think uh, this is where you find the international policy, which I mentioned earlier, around their intention of placing that dual-pronged approach uh, on both decision makers and firms, uh, having potentially adverse effects. 
uh, and we have to find a balance here. However, the, the route is that there needs to be the powers at least to implement um, those penalties. So it has to be handled carefully, but it's not something that's unique to Jersey. And George, just on that point, I mean, obviously, with your, your experience with the FATF um, before coming back to Jersey, you've obviously had a really sort of great uh, overview of what other jurisdictions are doing in this, in this place. Um, is the answer, uh, rather than getting to the supervision and the enforcement stage, to, to front load it more um, and do sort of more education with uh, businesses and more training uh, to, to ensure that it doesn't get to the, the extreme end? I don't know if perhaps you want to comment on that before Kerry or Kerry would like to. No, thanks. Thanks, Lisa. And, and absolutely. So I think the key area we want to talk about here is as part of increasing our financial crime work as a jurisdiction, we want to do much more outreach and engagement. Uh, and that was mentioned by the minister in his early remarks. It's partially being reflected uh, in the events we've done so far with industry, such as today. But one of the requests we've consistently had from industry is they would like to have the regime uh, either simplified or explained more to them as to the expectations of the regulator and the jurisdiction. Uh, and I think that outreach uh, and engagement is a key part of our work over the next two years to ensure that actually uh, supervision and enforcement uh, is only used uh, in, or enforcement is only used in, in, in areas where it's necessary uh, and proportionate, uh, and that actually understanding of the regime to avoid avoid penalties can be built in earlier. So that's something that's absolutely committed to in the government strategy. Okay, thank you, George. Um, Kerry, if I can come to you for this next question. Uh, does the JFSC feel confident that it has the de depth of expertise to properly identify offenders and administer the new scheme and regime? Yes, um, so people's strategy um, and uh, making sure that the development um, of our staff is, is one of our key priorities. Um, as much as just following on from uh, the, the answer that George just gave, uh, the Commission is uh, committed to its outreach work with industry um, and compliance uh, professionals. Our feedback papers are really important, as are our increased use of webinars. Um, so um, I echo what George says in that space, but that equally um, fits for us as a regulator uh, um, and making sure that our staff um, are uh, trained sufficiently and adequately and we have the right resource around that. That. And I think the consultation on the decision-making process is part of that. Um, but our people strategy, uh, which people will hear more about, I wouldn't anticipate in quarter four of this year, um, is a key part as well for uh, for the regulator. Is this likely to um, sort of incur increased costs though for the regulator and, and there, therefore impact industry? I mean, that's again something that I'm hearing from members in terms of from, from, from your resource perspective. And again, this comes to uh, the, the importance of us looking at our key processes mm. um, and making sure there are efficiency within those processes so we can um, use our resources wisely um, so that we're not looking to um, overly increase costs where we can drive efficiencies ourselves um, as the regulator and supervisor in Jersey. And will that be a sort of a pretty objective standard across the board or will that lead to some of the other comments I've had from members is will that lead to some subjectivity depending on who's who's doing that review how do, how do we ensure consistency across the board in terms of sorry Lisa I, I in, in terms of uh, the you know in terms of the review process in terms of reviewing uh, sort of the, you know the local members in terms of uh, whether they're adhering to the necessary standards how do we ensure that consistency across the board in terms of the, the same uh, method, methodology is a, is a, a you know sort of approached for all yes so we are um, always cognizant of looking internally at mm -hmm. our processes um, and our challenge process um, to ensure that the right cases are being taken forward mm -hmm. um, we will work with firms to remediate that's our first uh, place before we launch into uh, using enforcement resources, uh, working with entities where possible, um, before we engage the, um, the enforcement tools. So working closely and having that challenge and scrutiny internally um, around ensuring that we are um, using our resources appropriately. Okay, thank you. George, if I can come to you uh, next. Um, one question uh, from one of our viewers. Although the consultation paper um, specifically refers to DNF uh, BPs, will the amendment to the legislation bring all Schedule 2 businesses into scope, including lenders? I'm not sure if you'd like to answer them. Perhaps I can go to Kerry for any additional thoughts. Thanks, George. Yeah, yes, no, the intention is to bring everything within the DNF BP definition in the FATF, which will include lenders, casinos, etc., uh, into the scope. So that will be, that will be part of the framework amendment. 
Okay, is there anything you'd like to add to carry on that one? No, I, I think George has answered that question. Um, it, it, it falls within the Part B of Schedule 2. Okay, thank you. Now, in terms of uh, this uh, sort of pressure in relation to recruiting compliance uh, staff, there's, uh, as I say, say, it's a very popular question that's being, there's various uh, variations uh, being asked. Will the JFSC change its policy to allow outsourcing of compliance if there's a problem locally to try and recruit um, senior and experienced compliance officers? So I think that's a really interesting question and I would um, urge for that question to come through the consultation sure. so that we can consider that, Lisa. Sure. No, that's, uh, f that's fine. Okay, in terms of um, how will the JFSC cope with exercising these extra powers if more resources are needed? Okay, that's the higher fees one. That's already been dealt with. Um, in terms of uh, should the breaches be subject to judicial process instead of the JFSC's perception? So picking this point up before about the subjectivity potentially and objectivity, um, what's, do you have any thoughts in terms of um, whether they should be subject to a judicial process at all? So um, the, the, the way and the powers of operation uh, for the JFSC are set out in the statutory uh, legislation um, and that will uh, mean that where uh, individuals or entities uh, are um, believe that the Commission's decision has been reached unreasonably in all of the circumstances, there is an appeal provision uh, to the Royal Court uh, to put that into a judicial process. Okay. Um, why will the review committee be replaced by an internal procedure? Uh, this is hardly transparent. Yes, so the review committee, um, we uh, determined to be quite, as I say, a lengthy process with submissions from uh, the entities or individuals at that stage of the process. Um, and this is what was driving it to become a lengthy process. We believe that with sufficient uh, challenge uh, amongst the executive, that we can achieve the same level um, of scrutiny and independence of cases. Um, but then the stage three and the stage four process is important. Um, and at stage four, individuals and entities will have uh, the opportunity to make both written and oral submissions. Um, so it's really just shortening that process. Okay, now one viewer has said, um, you say that this will make the DMP cheaper. Can you explain why this is? Um, how many have gone through the DMP process and why was it expensive? So in terms of it being expensive, like I say, um, it, individuals um, and entities are engaged very early in the process um, and it hasn't had that objective um, eye from our Board of Commissioners um, bringing objectivity to the case that we are um, uh, we are taking forward. So it means that there are legal expenses that are incurred very early on in the process for individuals and entities, um, whereas now this will come much later in the process um, and at that one stage of the process. Okay, thank you. Um, George, I don't know if you want to comment on this at all, actually, but there's um, one question in terms of uh, saying about the Commission moving towards a tribunal system similar to that already in Guernsey, and at least those sitting on a tribunal have the requisite legal expertise. I'm not sure if you want to comment, and then Kerry, or perhaps Kerry, do you want to comment at all on that in terms of this uh, recent proposal? Yes, so um, I, I, as I touched on just before, the, um, the powers rest with the Board of Commissioners through the statutory legislation um, to move to a tribunal uh, position uh, may in, uh, require some legislative change. Um, it's not something that we have considered at this particular juncture. Um, and so that really, is, we're staying within the administrative process uh, with these changes to the decision-making process. I, George, I'm not sure if there's anything you'd like to add to that. So I think I'd just like to add to that, that um, a tribunal process is another process that can be used and is used by some regulators around the world, but equally uh, administrative processes used in the majority of regulators around the world uh, have processes and procedures built in uh, which protect the individual's human rights uh, and have the ability for fair and reasonable decision making. Uh, that is by far the most common uh, form of civil penalty regime in, in a financial regulatory regime. Uh, the Guernsey situation is, is, is a rarity, I think, in that. In terms of the legal representation, uh, the process still allows for legal representation to be made uh, and for an individual to have legal representation and their, their legal rights protected. Um, but if people felt very strongly in the consultation in relation to a tribunal regime and how that might look, 
uh, we would encourage them to respond on that. But equally, I would encourage you to respond on looking further afield to other jurisdictions, and particularly other international finance centres where they've used a, a, a regime that's far more similar uh, to what we're proposing uh, in the consultation. OK, thanks, George. George, perhaps another one for you uh, also that's uh, very popular on Slido. Why is it that Jersey repeatedly waits until the next inspection is imminent until it acts? Recommendation 35 isn't new. So thanks, Lisa. I think this is probably down to uh, it, probably somewhat the, the somewhat confusing way in which the international evaluations work. Uh, firstly, you tend to have one roughly every seven to 10 years for a jurisdiction. Uh, and secondly, the standards change very, very regularly. Um, the implementation of how you put new standards into place has to follow uh, an order. Uh, and that also usually tends to look behind, particularly in, in, these, in, in these set of standards, so the revised 2012 standards, uh, a risk assessment. And many of you will be familiar with the fact that we spent 2016, 17, 18 conducting the national risk assessment, which actually probably needed to come first before we looked at statutory amendments to the framework. That's because the entire of the FATF standards are based on a risk-based approach. Uh, and if you can put that in place with a full understanding of risk and context that you face as a jurisdiction, it's a more advisable way uh, to comply with the international standards. So it's certainly not something we deliberately wait for. It's also not like the money value evaluation is next week. These are two year processes starting uh, between next year and 2024 uh, and is part of a large series of policy and legislation that will be coming into force before the end of 2022. OK, thanks, George. Now, perhaps one for you and Kerry, maybe. Um, it's in terms of definitions. Um, so how will the Commission provide greater clarity to the industry regarding the individuals who will be caught within the senior management definition? So um, this consultation is really important to inform us um, in that area, as we've already touched on during the course of um, today. Um, but equally, we will be looking to issue um, a, a guidance document around those that we consider will be caught uh, within that uh, senior management uh, definition. OK, because I think what I am hearing from members is there's, there's quite a variation between what people regard as senior management and therefore who, who could get caught. Um, and also, just whilst we're on the, the topic of uh, definitions, will significant and material contraventions of the MLO now be defined? So there isn't um, a definition proposed for significant and material. What I would say is that uh, there are some public statements already um, in the public domain uh, which give a, a steer towards um, what we have so far regarded as significant and material. We would, of course, uh, you know, take into consideration um, where we see instances of a business model, for example, that has encouraged disregard uh, for the regulatory requirements or um, a gross absence of process and procedures, um, and instances where there's a significant uh, risk posed to AML CFT uh, in Jersey. Um, those are the sort of areas that we will be focused on. And we will, where we issue civil financial penalties, issue a public statement. Um, and that hopefully will begin over time to inform uh, the industry um, precisely what we regard as significant and material. OK, and just on this theme, um, and I think this follows on very much from the webinar that yourself and Jill Britton did recently, uh, which I found very helpful in terms of putting into context actually how many cases are actually brought to the enforcement uh, stage um, it, when you put that in the context of the, the, over, the overall ones that are, are reviewed. Um, but one question along that line is, um, it has been said that remediation is dead and all errors and failings fall to enforcement. Is that true? I would say that is not true. Um, there is a lot of work undertaken by our supervisors to work with firms and businesses to remediate issues. Um, we take very careful consideration before um, enforcement action or referral to enforcement is made. Um, but you know, our, our starting point is to work with firms and businesses to remediate their businesses, to bring them back into compliance. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just still on this theme, actually, um, if there's an option for money laundering breaches to be investigated by the Commission rather than the Law Officers Department, should this be considered a good news for industry? So uh, at the moment, the breaches of the MLO uh, money laundering order do sit um, in the criminal um, uh, arena and this will broaden the scope for us to bring money laundering order breaches into the civil financial penalty um, area for regulatory outcome. Um, I think in terms of um, how that would be taken forward for criminal consideration, I would ask people to 
uh, visit our website and have a look at the guidance notes we have on referrals to the Attorney General um, around when we will refer serious contraventions um, for criminal consideration. Okay, thank you. George, if I can come back to you. Um, we were talking before about the experience uh, from your FATF uh, background um, and the, the fact that you've, you've got a good overview in terms of what's happening in other jurisdictions. One of the questions from the viewers is, whilst other jurisdictions haven't seen issues in filling roles, our resource pool is much smaller. So will government provide an incentive to encourage um, from outside uh, Jersey some resourcing? I think it's a very, very good question uh, and something that the government will certainly think about. The government have committed for some time, both in their financial services strategy uh, and in the financial crime strategy, will look to both using human resource and technological resource to increase our ability to, to service financial services uh, as, as the main driving uh, economic driver to Jersey. So I think it's a very good point and something that could be put forward. Uh, again, uh, as Kerry mentioned, the JFSC are looking at a people's strategy for themselves. The government are looking at what people the industry will need uh, in our financial services framework, which will be re 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 refreshed earlier this year, uh, later this year. Um, that's something that we will certainly look at and the, the need for more experienced compliance staff and how to get them on Ireland is something that can certainly be considered. Okay, thank you very much to our viewers. These questions are coming through thick and fast at the moment still, which is, which is a good sign because uh, this is a really excellent opportunity to, for you to put forward your thoughts and concerns uh, for our panellists. Um, perhaps one, if I could come to you, Kerry, um, how can the JFSC justify charging a civil financial penalty against income derived from activities that are not within the regulatory scope? So this will uh, give rise to the, the FATF recommendation 35 around um, any sanction needs to be proportionate um, and dissuasive and therefore to, uh, to make sure that we encompass the, um, the entire activity of, of the business um, is really important when we look at trying to ensure that, that the, the, the sanction that is delivered is indeed dissuasive, proportionate um, and, and effective. You, you must be psychic because that, that was what that was my next question on slide A. So there's a perception that penalties are driven by a desire to send a message. What reassurance can be given around objectivity and proportion application? So I think I think we've answered both of those, which is uh, which is helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, in terms of they seem to be very much JFSC focused, unfortunately, Kerry. George, I think you, you've uh, you've had a, the, the easier task at this lunchtime uh, in terms of um, on a serious note, though, uh, how will the Commission provide meaningful help, support and training to individuals alongside the ever more onerous requirements? Yes, that's a good question. We're very focused um, as the regulator and supervisor um, here in Jersey around our outreach program uh, with industry. Um, it's a really important part for us. Uh, the increased use, like I say, of our webinars and our outreach program, stakeholder engagement is really critical and key, as is issuing the, uh, the feedback papers to provide some clarity around the JFSE expectations for compliance is really important. Um, we hear the messages that, uh, that industry really would like some greater clarity around our principles-based regulations. So um, it, we, we have this in hand and it is something that we are very focused on. Okay, super. George, if I can come to you for this next one, um, and it might be that we, we go back to Kerry for it if you, if you uh, feel she's perhaps a better place to comment, but fines in Jersey are already routinely higher than in Guernsey. Uh, won't the proposals make us more unattractive as a jurisdiction, George? Uh, so I think it, it's not possible to look at that in, in, a sing, in a singular vision. You have to consider it in relation to what the fines were, were given for. So it will all depend on, on the relevant contravention. But recent fines in Guernsey have been different because there's been recent fines, particularly at six-figure level, against individuals, which we yet don't have the power for. Uh, and again, if we look at other jurisdictions, we've seen significantly higher fines on firms, particularly in the Cayman Islands, uh, in, the recent, in the recent past. And, and that's included both firms in the DNFBP category as, as well as more traditional financial institutions and, and TCSPs. Um, so it's not really possible to consider it singly, but it needs to be considered against the wrongdoing that's identified and in the entire risk and context of the jurisdiction. Um, so that's something that I would encourage, uh, encourage people to look at. Okay, thanks very much indeed, George.
Um, we're almost coming to the close of our questions now. I'm sure that you and Kerry will be pleased to hear. Um, in terms of, I think we've touched on this before, Kerry, but perhaps in a slightly different format is, will this result in a change to the currently published commission guidance for referring matters to the police and the Attorney General? So uh, we don't uh, envisage at the moment we'll be reviewing that guidance. Um, it is there and I would urge people to provide any feedback that they have through the consultation process, um, but it's not something that we are currently considering. Okay, and just on this point about sort of the, when we're talking about the Attorney General and the Law Officers Department and the sort of burden of proof, one question is the civil burden of proof is the balance of probability. Um, therefore, is it likely fines will be levied without proof of wrongdoing? I think the enforcement investigation will have to prove um, the element of wrongdoing and for individuals prove the, the connivance, the ne ne negligent conduct or reckless conduct um, and the aiding and abetting. Um, it certainly wouldn't uh, be taken forward uh, to, to uh, civil penalties without any level of proof of the breach. Um, and again, the objectivity of the board, they would expect to see a level of evidence to prove that uh, the, the breach has indeed been found. Okay. Um, does this change drive the need for the Commission to issue guidance on roles classed as material risk takers? So could ask for some clarity around that question a little bit more. Yeah, I think I'd probably yeah, need some more clarity around that yeah. question, sorry. Perhaps that's one we can come back to in the context of the consultation itself. Um, only a couple more now, actually. Um, will the protection for whistleblowers be reviewed and cross-referenced when considering who to subject to penalty to give those in scope more options? So the whistleblowing policy, I think, is a wider consideration. I don't think I can comment much further on that today, Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that like I say, um, it, it, we will be looking at it, um, but I, I, I don't have any time frames. I can't, can't really say much more on that at the moment. And I think certainly there's a question on here if a key person suggests changes to the RP control regime, which is rejected by the board, and lack of change results in a breach, does that key person have a defence? I think that's probably bordering on more the legal advice, actually, so we'll, we'll stay clear of that one. Um, I think in terms of... We're almost there, actually, because I think most of these are pretty much repeats of what we've we've had uh, before. Are we reaching the point where there is more dissuasive to businesses and hardworking individuals than it is to criminals? I think that's perhaps just more of a comment than a, than a, a question on that one. Um, so I think we've actually answered all of our questions online. So thank you very much indeed uh, to our viewers for all of these. I mean, we've, we've had a, a bit of a whistle stop tour there through through them all. I'm also uh, conscious of the, the time as well. Um, so I'd like to express my sincere thanks to Senator Gorst, Minister for External Relations and Financial Services, to Kerry Petula, Director of Enforcement at the JFSC, to George Pearmain, Director for the Financial Crime Strategy within the Government team, and uh, their respective contributions this afternoon, which are greatly appreciated. Um, I'd also like to thank you, our viewers online, for all of your questions. Uh, we've rattled through them, I appreciate, at some speed, and uh, we've tried to, uh, to get through as many of those key concerns uh, that you all have. But we really would encourage you to respond to both the government consultation and the JFSC consultation. Uh, both of them can be found on the respective websites, and as we've mentioned, the deadline for the um, submissions is the 1st of September. Um, I hope that you found this afternoon's panel session helpful. Um, if uh, there are any questions that you think of after today's event and which you'd like to uh, put forward, please do uh, include those within your responses. Um, a copy of uh, the recording from today will be on the government and the JFC websites. Uh, if you can't find those on the YouTube channels, I understand that they will be on the government Instagram uh, channel. Um, and uh, I'd just like to conclude uh, by expressing my sincere thanks to Alex Mallison, uh, Nikita Carter and Bastian Herstein of the government team, to Abby Nance and all of the comms team at the JFSC, to Phil Bouchard and Rob Ritchie um, and their respective teams at 3CI and Stage 2 Productions for all of their help and assistance with today's event. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us and I wish you all a good afternoon.